Who am I? Well, I'm a 22-year-old activist and politician from New Zealand, so a relatively small country in the Pacific. Uh, we uh, we punch above our weight, though, in many different ways, and I'm from a community which also does the same, a small seaside village of Taikakarehi of only 1,700 people. And I got involved in sort of standing up for our collective home, our planet, through understanding the impact that climate change and rising sea levels would have on the place that I call home and the people that I feel so deeply connected to. And then that led me somehow to running for council. And so I very much see sort of my role around the Kapiti Coast District Council table as still being that same activist that helped to found the School Strike for Climate movement in New Zealand, something I'm very proud to have been a part of. And yeah, so I, I kind of connect, I guess, my mission and my why to being able to say that by the end of my life, I did everything in my power and used my voice to its full potential to speak up for our planet. Yeah, so the specific moment, I guess, that is most prevalent to me is when I was 12 years old, my parents, well, and myself, the family home in which I grew up in, we received a letter in the mail, funnily enough, from the Kapiti Coast District Council, which is now the elected body that I sit on and am a part of, saying that in the next 50 years, the threat of the climate crisis and the increasing severity of, of weather events and the increasing uh, frequency of them and also rising sea levels would have on on our family home. And to me, you know, I, I when I first saw my parents sort of open up this letter and, and look at each other pretty concerned, not only knowing the financial impact that it'll have on us, but also the the kind of social and environmental impacts that it'll have on the wider community. I sort of started asking them questions and and getting curious about what and why this thing called climate change was and how we could do our bit to to stop it and to minimize its harm. And in that same year, so when I was 12, year eight at, at primary school, I invited our local member of parliament to speak to our class. And a bunch of my friends were like, that's nerdy. <laughs> That's so weird. Why do we have this member of parliament coming in and, and kind of telling us um, what's right? But the, the reason why I did that was, again, kind of piqued by the curiosity that I felt around wanting to understand the responsibility that these people in, in power feel or should feel to our future, like the decisions that are or aren't being made now, ultimately we inherit. And so I simply put the question to him, what are you doing? What are you doing to make sure that young people like me aren't growing up scared, our parents aren't faced with this terrible reality, and also those in the Pacific who are already on the front lines right now actually have a right to a dignified life in their homelands without their culture and, and history being stripped away from them due to something that's being imposed, you know, by the by the global north that is essentially just being landed on them in the form of rising seas. And his answer was the thing that stuck with me and one of the things that's continued to drive me to this point was he said, that's a question that's probably better put to our climate change spokesperson. And I was like, no, you should feel a responsibility if I, as a 12-year-old kid, feel a responsibility to do something about it and you've got a seat in our halls of power and you're a leader of New Zealand, the fact that you don't feel that responsibility to front up, sorry, but that's just not good enough. And so, yeah, the, the kind of question of why aren't our leaders leading on this when we know what's at stake, it's our entire collective home, it's everything that we love. So yeah, that, that was kind of a moment and I guess a series of events that, <laughs> that's really um, yeah, impacted what I do and why I do it. Oh, I can think of I can think of quite a few. And I, I do want to emphasize though that these successes are no way just as a result of my work as a change maker and, and instead the work of a an awesome crew of young people. I would first identify the school strike for climate movement and on the 27th of September 2019, we mobilized 3.5% of New Zealand's entire population which is the largest single day strike in New Zealand's history. Now that was organized by myself and roughly 20 other young people, the youngest of which being eight years old. 
and we had a couple thousand dollars. We we didn't really know what we were doing, but we were all driven by the same mission, the same purpose, and we pulled this thing off, which meant that a climate emergency was declared in New Zealand. The Zero Carbon Act was passed. We now have an emissions reduction plan. We had the Prime Minister ringing us up and saying that she wanted to meet with us. It was like this, again, this sort of snowball effect of once we pulled together a whole bunch of young people, stuff started moving. And so the hope that that gave other young people that if they want to mobilise a movement, you don't actually need that much. All you need is a little bit of belief in yourself and the cause that you're standing up for. And actually so much as possible. So I think that was a real big success. In the context of council, running for council at the age of 18 and being elected and doing so with a campaign team of entirely young people, that was another commitment that I made to myself is that if this is going to be, you know, truly reflective of what I'm trying to achieve in this space, this this campaign is going to be youth led. The young people who have been involved with the campaign have now gone on to do the most amazing things and they're creating impact in their own ways. And so what makes me so proud and and what I feel like has been successful about a lot of the work that I've been a part of is that it has so many ripple effects. Yeah, I think in terms of what organisations need to do and, and need to understand, is that the importance of just taking that one first step is crucial. So don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Don't wait until you have permission or until you have all the resource or all the knowledge to get started on this journey to sustainability or zero emissions. But instead, taking that first step and sort of seeding inspiration and ideas is actually the only way that we're going to be able to build a movement towards more sustainable systems and more intergenerationally equitable systems. Like if I had have waited to start the School Strike for Climate Movement in New Zealand until I felt fully prepared to do so, it wouldn't have happened. And the change that we've seen at a governmental level in New Zealand would not have been to the same extent. So the thing I would say is, yeah, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Ask for help. No one knows all the answers. And there are so many people who are willing to support you on this journey because yeah, we've got to link arms and we've got to figure out how we can sort of make this ecosystem of change where we're each sort of contributing to each other's downfalls and supporting each other where we possibly can. Yeah, so the Strategy Operations and Finance Committee is is council's major committee. So it's a committee of the full council that everyone sits on. Also, our our Indigenous partners sit around the table too and have full voting rights and are fully remunerated to be there, which is one thing I'm really proud of, um, of, of being able to sort of help enable, which is quite exciting. And our responsibilities are vast and also kind of quite big. So we we deal with the setting of strategies, policies, bylaws. Uh, we sign off submissions, which come directly from council and go to central government. But I think why it's quite exciting to me is that it connects up sort of all of the key pillars of actually making stuff happen. Because if you've got the, the strategy, if you know where you're going and why you're going in that direction, if you've got the operational settings to to help deliver on that, and then you've got the financial commitment to make that happen, there's actually not much that my committee can't do, which is which is quite exciting. And I feel incredibly honoured that as the youngest councillor around our table by 30 years, that our mayor actually kind of landed me with that responsibility. And it's it's definitely not something I take lightly. And in terms of the ways that I've sort of used it to to make a difference. So for the first time ever, our council has set 10 strategic priorities, which in the past, we've just sort of done long-term plan after long-term plan. Every three years, we revisit. Um, But this time around, we've set sort of for the next 60 years, we've got a list of 10 strategic priorities. Climate is number two on that list, which I've kind of built consensus around my colleagues to make happen. We just last week became the first council in New Zealand to sign on to the call for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty globally. We've set an emissions reduction target for our council's emissions 
10 years before the rest of New Zealand and we've got an implementation plan in place and the operational framework to make that happen. So there's a whole bunch of things that I've been able to do and I'm thankful for the support from my colleagues. Yeah, I could probably take this question from a number of different angles because there have been some sort of challenges internally that I've had to process, such as imposter syndrome, self-confidence, just believing that actually my voice and my skill set is, is important and should be valued in the space of politics, specifically when, you know, what we imagine as a typical politician is probably not me. So that's part of the, the reason why I do what I do too, is to help to change that and to hold the door open for other young people. So that's been a challenge is sort of navigating those conversations with my community where I felt like I've had to work doubly hard to earn their trust and their respect and, and vice versa with my colleagues. You know, now chairing this major committee is feeling like I have to constantly prove myself and kind of, yeah, work double time to show that that I deserve this role and that I'm going to use it to make transformational change. Another challenge has just been sort of a lack of education or awareness as to the importance of the actions that we're trying to take in our community by the residents themselves. And one thing though that I've just always come back to is leadership, I believe too, is being ahead of that curve. Sometimes our people don't know what's best for them. And actually leadership is having the the foresight to to look ahead and go, cool, you might not like us now because we're going to charge you extra rates. You might not necessarily see the long-term benefit, but just hold on and you will in five, 10 years, but actually your, your, your kids, your grandkids, they will be the ones to eat the fruits. And so I think that's been a real challenge, navigating that conversation. How I've gotten through it, I've just kept banging the drum. I've just kept chipping away at the stone and yeah, just been persistent. I think being young is a superpower. I'm 100% a believer that we all have superpowers and being young is totally one of those because we have this sort of perspective that I don't believe any other generation has where we know what's at stake because we we sit in, in this moment in time and are able to look to the future knowing that we will inherit whatever that future is. And, you know, other generations are, I feel like, potentially quite caught up in the now where I think because we, yeah, we know that what does or doesn't happen now shapes that future that we have so much of a stake in, I think that gives us a really unique perspective in the conversation. I also think our energy and our ambition and our willingness to just kind of call things what they are and not beat around the bush is super important in this sort of political landscape that we have at the moment where there seems to be a lot of sort of tiptoeing around the issue, not being able to call fossil fuel industries as the culprit in the climate crisis. You know, for example, when... Um, in various agreements that have been settled at COP, the fossil fuel industry hasn't even been named. I think if you had young people who were sitting at those tables, we would just say, call it. Like, call it for what it is. We have to, if we're not going to name the issue, how are we going to solve it? So I think we're straight to the point. And yeah, I think our courage and ambition is desperately needed at a time where, again, if we don't take this action now, what sort of future will, will we be passing on? I think we overturn all of our decision-making bodies and put young people at the helm of them. Because again, I think about the changes that I'd want to make in the environmental sphere, the changes that I want to make socially in terms of distribution of wealth globally, distribution of food resource. I'd, I'd want you know the fossil fuel industry to be held to account and for us to phase out the use and production of them. I think again, if we had young people at the helm, those sorts of decisions would be being made. And so instead of just saying one of those decisions, I'm going to say something that I believe would transform those systems to be able to deliver the decisions that our next generation needs. Yeah.
Yeah, what's next for me? Well, we have had a pretty, in my view, sombering election result just as of last weekend, where we now have a right-wing government, and that will potentially mean a whole lot of backward steps in relation to the, the momentum that we built for climate justice. And so while I'm very much focused on my local council role and continuing to serve as chair of strategy operations and finance, uh, after these next two years, which will see the end of my second term on council, I think I'll reevaluate whether locally the the impact is sort of the biggest that I can be creating or whether I need to look to potentially central government. I've volunteered for um, various political parties since since the age of 13. So I've kind of been out leafleting, door knocking, phone banking, waving signs, dancing on the side of the street to mobilize people to get out and vote. And yeah, I'm just feeling more and more like at a at a nationwide level and also those kind of geopolitical relationships, connections and kind of international relations, that there's a lot of leverage for for change, specifically if New Zealand does sort of truly step up and take the leadership role that I think we need to. Um, so I'll, yeah, I'll kind of, I guess, reevaluate whether the biggest impact is made locally or nationally, and also will keep up the activism till the day that I die. 